Hi, I'm Donna McGeorge, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. Welcome to A Productive Conversation. I'm Mike Vardy, and I am joined on this episode by Donna McGeorge. Uh, We talk about the book, The One Day Refund, Take Back Time, Spend It Wisely, and she is the productivity coach. She's obsessed with helping people make their work work, and she uses a creative and practical approach to improve workplace efficacy and challenges traditional thinking, which I loved, and we talk about that, on things like leadership, productivity, and working smarter. We talk about elements of the book. We talk about capacity, energy, stopping, making time for things, definitely mutual uh, admiration of how we think about time and productiveness. So let's get to this conversation. Here is my conversation with Donna McGeorge. Enjoy. Donna, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on the program. This is a conversation that's been a long time in the works. Oh, hasn't it just? We've been trying to make this happen for quite some time, and I'm thrilled that we managed to make it happen today. And thanks for having me on your show. No problem at all. So b- before we get really into it, I mean, the first off, the book that we're going to be looking at today is, is from the It's About Time, The One Day Refund, Take Back Time, Spend It Wisely. Um, what got you fascinated about time? Like, what was the thing that kind of drew you in? I get that question a lot myself. And so it's always interesting to hear the other side of the story from somebody else who has a very, you know, I mean, as I went through the book, I'm like, oh, Donna has a really cool relationship with time. So I'd love to hear some of your origin story on that. Well, I think it's interesting that you do, you said just two words, just in the last part of that question, um, relationship with time and origin story. And I think it's because my origin story is being raised by in a military uh, household. My dad was in the Navy. And so we lived by adages like, there's no excuse for being late. You know, if you're on time, you're late. Uh, very organized. Um, I went to nine schools in nine in nine years over one particular period. And, you know, having to be on the ball, organized, good to go, was just a bit of an imperative. And I didn't know that, though, until I got into work. And, you know, I was always the kid at school that got their assignments in. I never needed um, extensions or anything like that. But when I got into the world of work, it was nearly a surprise to me that people ran around pulling their hair out, crazy stressed, because I seemed to be able to get through a power of work in a nine to five framework that people started to ask me questions. How come you get so much done and you never seem phased? And so I asked my siblings about this because I thought, oh, is it just me or is it a, a, a product of that? No, they said the same thing. You know, my brother even got pulled into a a discussion one day where they said, you know, we're very concerned that you clearly don't have enough to do because you don't seem stressed. You you seem happy about your work, right? And so I think it is, you know, you know, origin story is the right word for it. So um, Navy upbringing, pretty productive through my kind of corporate years. And then I started teaching and writing about it, you know, sharing the word, so to speak, of how how I do the world and, and my relationship with time. So the story you brought up about your brother is, is fascinating because it, it is interesting that if you feel like you have things under control, you know, then there must be something wrong, right? You know what I mean? Like this idea of, and I mean, we know having looked at this, there's, there's you stress and then there's stress and you need a certain amount of it. But the fact that we're pushing to capacity and we're going to talk a little bit about that is seems to be it's one of the biggest problems about the the idea of productivity is if you're not always doing something or if you're not stressed out then clearly you don't have enough to do and why how do you kind of push back against that fallacy yeah because i do i push back on that hard like this idea that we have to be 100 percent on 100 percent of the time the idea that if i catch myself in a daydreaming moment i'm wasting time that if i'm not filling every waking moment with some bit of activity you know i'm wasting time and and you know and i think in the 80s and 90s, there was this big movement around in the gaps, you know, like there's all these gaps that you have in life. You're driving to work, you're commuting, you could fill those gaps with wildly productive things. And and I'm like, no, no, we need gaps. We need space. And there's research, you know, well, where did it come from? I think mm. this party question um, is it's industrial revolution stuff, you know, that, that, you know, the opportunity, the time in motion studies, that the opportunity that we could take a 24 hour period of time and how can we make it as productive as possible and get people doing something every waking moment. That's kind of where it came from. 
But we've now got, I don't know, I want to say centuries, but we'll go with decades of technologies that were designed to give us more leisure time. Everything from vacuum cleaners and washing machines right through to, you know, brand new technologies like AI and chat GPT, which give us the, they, they all gave us the promise of you won't have to spend all day doing your laundry now, or you won't have to spend all day writing copy for something now, right? And yet, you know, so let's say something that used to take, you'll just use ChatGPT as an example, something that might've taken you hours to produce in the past, and you can now use ChatGPT, say, to shortcut that. What do you do with those hours you set aside? Does it mean you just now do more work, or do you take some time for leisure? Mm -hmm. Because um, I think or, this is or the deeper issue. work, or like work that or you deeper can, yeah. or more value work. Right. Yes, exactly. Right, 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 exactly. The Chat GPT stuff is fascinating to me right now. I mean, Isn't we're it? recording this in <laughs> in uh, late February, but the fact of the matter is, is that if someone was to ask me right now, like, what's one of the best ways? And you talked about this, the idea of getting a, re a refund on your time, mm. right? Like the, mm. a refund of time, which which I'll ask you to explain in a minute. But someone's saying like. Give me a life hack. I'm like, chat GPT. Like, a lot of this stuff is because I am not good at writing a bio, but chat GPT is. And the reason I'm not good at it isn't because I'm not a good writer. It's that I struggle with the let's talk about me at this high level, whereas chat GPT could do that, or I could hire a copywriter. And there's lots of arguments about jobs being taken and all that stuff, which again, I think is natural when new technology emerges. It just changes things. Um, but the, the idea of getting time back, um, which we know is not really what actually is happening. We're just utilizing it better. But this concept of getting, you know, using technology, leveraging the resources that we have so that we could either have more leisure time, have, you know, time to do more creative pursuits, which is why it was fascinating to me seeing like people tweet about you know, the idea of like, why are we getting AI to make art? We should be getting it to do the things that we don't want to do so that we can make art, right? So there's mm -hmm. all this fascination around it. But what fascinated me is this idea of getting a refund on your time. So can you explain that one day refund idea? Uh, because people are always looking, and, and the, the fact you can bring it in as a metaphor, time, money, we know that those things are commonly associated. So let's get into that, this idea of a, a getting a refund of time. Yeah, sure. So it came about after, of course, two years in the pandemic. And uh, I lived in Victoria in Australia, where we had some of the toughest lockdowns in the world over 2020 and 2021. And, you know, when I would say to people, you know, prior to the pandemic, you'd say to someone, you know, if you had an extra day in your week, what would you do with it? And they would tell you all the right answers. They'd say, I'd go to the gym, I'd do creative pursuits, I'd do art, I'd spend time with my kids, you know, all the, I'd sleep, whatever it might be. Like I'd do all these amazing leisure-filled things. And yet when the uh, pandemic hit and we were all in lockdowns and the average commute for most people to say to Melbourne, as an example, is about an hour door to door. Mm. And so we technically got back two hours a day, do the math, 10 hours a week. That's a day. Yeah. Right? That's a day we got back. And when I'd say to people, what did you do with it? You know, they kind of, they wouldn't make eye contact and they'd sheepishly look away and say, oh, you know, I just did extra emails, subsumed it into my work. I started and ended my days longer. Um, and so I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe people need some help around thinking about how, how could they take back an hour or two a day or seven hours a week or whatever, however you want to do the maths around this so that they can you know, either use their time better or be able to do some of these pursuits you talked about, deeper work, better quality work, art, artistic and creative pursuits. Um, and that's kind of how it came about. Um, so yeah. I want to get into, because we, I mean, we've had Ashley Willens on the show to talk about time smart. We've had uh, John Zaratsky on the show to talk about making time. Um, we've, we both talk about this idea of, you know, the time you have is the time you have. Why do you think so many people just do the thing that they're so used to doing instead of taking a beat and saying, hold up, I could work smarter, not harder, for lack of a better term. Like, what, what is the barrier that you think people are facing to have this message? Not just, and it's what's interesting is you and I both know that it, it's not always the message, but the messenger that is the one that they'll listen to. Is that part of it? Or is it just 
there there's so much vying for their attention that they don't have they don't feel like they have a moment to stop and take as Julia Funt says take a moment or a minute to think and go wait a minute maybe I shouldn't fill those extra 2 hours per day with emails and fill them with something else or well, not fill them I at reckon, all <laughs> yeah well i think it's 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 the latter in your question mm. you know so there are enough of us out there bleating about this that you know they can't turn around without finding you know a global authority on productivity right. speaking about how to work smarter right so there's plenty of information out there so it could be a choice overload, right? So there's so mm-hmm. much I don't know what to do. Um, I think it's the classic, I don't have time to think about time. I don't have time to think about how I can save time. I don't have time to even test a strategy. And sometimes I get this, you know, I've got a coaching client right now. I gave her a strategy. I said, I want you to try this every morning for two weeks. I'm like a doctor. I diagnosed, here's your, here's your medication, away you go. I want you to do this for two weeks. And she came back to me and said, look, I really only did it four times. I didn't have time and it didn't work. I'm like, well, of course it didn't work. You only gave it four goes, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea that um, I'm so busy in the doing, I don't have time to to stop and think. It it feels counterintuitive to someone when they're working ridiculously long hours for me to say, if you just stopped and, you know, for an hour and just gave yourself a chance to breathe, you're going to end up ahead, but it just feels counterintuitive. I don't think they can hold those two ideas in their heads as well as I'd like. Well, uh, frankly. And, <laughs> and we're also when like folks like us are kind of counter to what they are used to hearing. So there's more mm-hmm. people not saying that stuff than are, right? Or there's more people yeah. not saying anything than are saying this. So it makes it it's it's and what I loved about what you brought up earlier was the idea of motion theory and Taylorism and all that stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what you've done is you've kind of turned it on its you said, okay, if this is how you this is how you quantify, you know, the use of your time, let's talk about capacity utilization. So let's let's get into that a little bit because that to me I think was something that I'm like as I was going through your book, I'm like, that I think is a hook when spoken about enough that people go, oh, that makes sense to me. So can we dive into that a little bit? Like, what do you mean by capacity utilization in the context of the idea of, you know, taking back time and spending it wisely? Sure. So I'm not going to talk about it from a manufacturing perspective. I'm going to talk about it from, you know, I'm one of your listeners. I'm thinking, how can I make a difference? Because I think capacity is is the conversation we should be having more than resilience or time management or to-do lists or any of those kinds of things. Because after, uh, this is probably showing my age more than anything, after about four decades of organisations downsizing people but not downsizing the work, it is not uncommon these days to have see an individual who survived all the downsizing but is now doing the job of four people, right? right? Yep. Um, and so there's a question that organisations need to ask. And I think the workforce is asking it. I think that's why we're seeing what some people refer to as the anti-work movement, which is the quiet quitting and the act your wage and all that sort of stuff, where people are actually asking questions now that say, wait, hang on a second, you're asking me to do what? I just don't have the capacity for that. Mm-hmm. And so they may not use those exact words, but so that's what, whoops, yeah. that's what I'm kind of talking about here. It's like, let's think about our capacity. So I think about it in, in, in terms of a, a, a product of uh, time and energy, you know, so if I have no time and no energy, then I've got impaired or zero capacity, right? I can't get off the couch. Mm-hmm. If I've got uh, a lot of time, but no energy, then I've probably got wasted capacity, right? Cause I've, you know, I've got a lot of time, but can't get moving uh, or surge capacity, which is where most people operate. I, I have a lot of energy, but not a lot of time. So I'm running, running, running all the time. And I'm constantly digging deep and finding that. And I can do that until I hit a wall, hit burnout, whatever. But the real trick, and this is what I love speaking about to people is where's your adaptive capacity? How do you create a world for yourself where you feel like you have plenty? And it probably sounds, people are thinking, oh, you're dreaming, plenty of time and energy to do the good work to show up as our best selves. And and so again, based on time in motion studies, Taylorism, manufacturing, all the capacity utilization frameworks, turns out 15% is a bit of a magic number around how much buffer do I need to build into my world so that when something changes, something breaks down, you know, I get hit with a curveball, something like that, I have got the capacity to manage that. And I think that's the real, real opportunity for people because most of us 
are in back-to-back meetings all day, end up having to do our, come home, eat our dinner, then have to work through till 10 o'clock at night to do our real work, catch mm-hmm. up on our email. And so if one thing goes wrong, just one thing goes wrong, it derails the whole lot. Yep. So we have to have some kind of capacity built in for that. What, as I was going through the book, you talked about the space framework, like the idea of different spaces. And I couldn't help but think about John Cleese and his speech where he talks about in order to do truly creative, great work, you need both time and space, which you just discussed in a very different way, the idea of energy and time, right? But the idea of if you – I know, I mean, and we'll link to the Cleese talk in the show notes or the article because it's really – I mean, the, it's true. As somebody who I – you know, as a creative first and foremost, I'm like, yeah, if you're rushed – um, you're not going to make great work, even if you have all the space in the world. And if you're, you have, <laughs> if you have very little space but a ton of time, you're going to feel cramped and it's going to feel restrictive. You need to have that. A- and you talk about the idea of working, like the different types of spaces, right? So when I'm as I'm going through, there's um, what are the three types? Oh, there's uh, there's thinking space, breathing space, and living space. Which of these, and then there's, of course, working space, which of these do you think that we need to work on the most? Like we pro- we have all four, right, like naturally, but in terms of being deliberate about using them, which do you think is the one that we struggle with? And like you said, if you struggle with one, then the house of cards tends to collapse. So, look, it, there's too many things that w- – that I want to say depends to around mm-hmm. which particular space. So I'm going to give you something called the capacity quiz. You can put it in the notes for this yeah. um, this episode as well. And it's a you know short quiz that you answer a few questions and it, it, it suggests which space you could use a bit more work on. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the interesting thing is you do work on any one of these spaces that cannot not affect the others. Right. And when I run workshops or work with people around this stuff, I go straight to thinking space as a starting point. And the reason being the three levers we pull there are decelerate, decompress and decide. In layman's terms, stop, take stock and figure out what the most important things you need to do. And it's the stopping that is the hardest part for people to do and yet yields the greatest results. Just that time. You know, I've got a client right now that knows her project is going over time. She knows she's under-resourced and she knows if she went and spoke to her boss and presented a reasonable business case, they would either give her more resources or extend the time of the project. But guess what? I don't have time to even stop and think about how I put that business case together. So there's a beautiful example of how I'm so busy on the treadmill that I'm not stopping. So I think that the thinking space one where we just stop um, and it's no different. If any of your listeners now uh, work in any kind of corporate environment and I say to them, you know, what does it feel like when someone cancels a meeting kind of at the last minute? You know, how do you feel? Just about everyone gives you a big smile and says, relieved. I've now got potentially a whole hour back in my day. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you kind of say to them, Now, listen to how ridiculous that sounds, is you only get an hour, a really, clearly, really valuable and useful hour if someone else cancels something. So you're at the mercy of the world Mm -hmm. (laughs) to give you some space. So I say, well, just start booking a meeting with yourself. Right, yeah. so book a meeting with yourself, and if and if if you want the real feel, you cancel it just before, and you can get the feeling of oh, meeting cancelled, all that joy. But it's just, seriously, we need to have that space. We have to stop at some point and take stock. Um, and the take stock is that the de- the decompressing is we got to get stuff out of our head. So you'd be familiar with David Allen, another, of course, um, of course uh, amazing you know productivity guru, who says the human mind is for having ideas, not storing them. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is part of our feelings of overwhelm and out of control and why we don't think we've got enough space to think and blah, 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 um, we've got to stop and empty our heads. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. it's, it's, so, it's interesting to me as we're having this conversation that the thing that we struggle the most with, but yet we feel like we have an understanding of is time because mm. we are terrible at judging how long or how little it takes to do something. Absolutely terrible. And, and the interesting thing is, I don't know how you feel about this, Donna, but if someone says to me like, oh, you must be really great at managing time. No, I am I I am good at, and David Allen talks about this too, self-management. I'm good at managing the things that live within time because time will not be managed. And the problem is, is that 
I believe, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is, is the, <laughs> the idea that we can manage time is, is purely there to create this, almost this like level of objectiveness towards work that we do that's rather subjective, right? And it's why, like what I, one thing I, and I'll air quote this, appreciated about the pandemic is that it did start to change some models of how we measure outcomes and results. And it's not by hours worked necessarily, which by the way, was a terrible metric in the first place now, but it was the one that we knew and it was the one that you could count. But now it's, what are the results? What's the outcomes? We're starting to see other qualitative measurement tools that have a quantitative bent to them. What I appreciate about what you've put in here is that you've, you've done the same. You've kind of said in, in your book, you've said, how do I quantify and qualify as much as possible in an area that is very challenging to do both in a balanced manner. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And it even comes down to little things, you know, like, so my view on time is it is, it's a, it's a construct. It's a human construct. That's just kind of a generalization that makes life easier to arrange for you and I to get on a call at 11 o'clock on, on a given day in, in the theory, morning. In theory. In theory. <laughs> but, but, you know, so it makes that easy for us to be sure. able to do that. But, but all you need to do is to go to Pacific Island as it's very Pacific Islands. It's very famous um, in the South Pacific and the Polynesian cultures where they call it island time and islander time where, you know, we say the word soon, which means to us somewhere in the next five minutes, you can say soon, that could mean somewhere in the next three to five days. Um, And so they have a completely different construct of time. I learned that as well a little bit. I did a lot of work in India and what we perceive to be punctuality is very different um, over there as well. And so when you learn that people have different models, you think, oh, okay, so this construct that I have isn't necessarily the only construct about time, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's really, um, really helpful. But I think the thing that I find um, most interesting is that that let's just go with five o'clock. Five o'clock is the time I finish work. Let's just say that people do a nine to five day. And so what I do is I try to rush all this stuff with this arbitrary deadline that that this construct has given me. That means at about 4.30 in the afternoon, that's the busiest time of day for emails as people are madly trying to finish up stuff, get things off their to-do list and try and get the monkey off their back. And so out they go and all these emails start flying around to everyone else trying to get out the door at about five o'clock. And so I do love this idea of, you know, I get that you want to knock off a particular time and you want to get home, et cetera. That doesn't mean that it has to be the end of your work, right? The work will still be there the next day. Why does there have to be this big full stop, you know? Well, because there's no such thing as a full stop. You're always, there's always going to be something to do. And as we get close to the end, I do want to talk to you about the bonus chapter that you have in here about (laughs) what you, and anyone who knows my, my work. So it's talking about like what to do during these, you know, the first two hours, right? So here's the thing. I'm a night owl. So as soon as I read this, I'm like, oh, Don and I are going to have a, a, a good chat about this because this doesn't necessarily work for me as written. So for those that listen, are listening to the show right now that are also night owls, how would you, fl- first off, explain the first two hours because I know people are going to pick up the book, but just for context. And then how would a night owl flip it? Right. So for the bulk of us uh, and about you know, 80, 75 to 80% of yep. us, Um, we have a body clock or a chronotype that says that we, you know, we, we go to sleep when, when it gets dark, we wake up when that's what our body's designed for. We go to sleep when it gets dark, Mm -hmm. melatonin gets produced, it stops being produced as the sun comes up, we wake up. Our most mentally active time or mentally alert time is around, you know, from about nine o'clock through to about one o'clock. And then in the afternoon, we, we definitely have a slump. Uh, this is most of us, if we have a slump, and then uh, we c- kind of come good a little bit in the afternoon again, uh, and that's kind of how our body clock works. That's in a nutshell. Sure. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, given that many of us are early birds or moderates, we, that's how we would measure ourselves, it seems a wicked shame that we would waste potentially the most productive two hours of our day 
on things that aren't necessarily productive, processing, emails, terrible meetings, just wasted stuff, right? right? So why wouldn't we use it for the work that requires the most level of deep work or mental intensity? So for you night owls, I would say, excellent. Can you identify and have you done the work to identify your best two hours? Mm-hmm. And so for you, I, you just adjust the clock, turn it appropriately, right? And it may not exactly work just by turning it, but I'd say, what are the best times? If The fact that you can identify as a night owl tells me you can probably say um, your, the time of day when you come good, yep. right? Yep, definitely, yep. And definitely. I, and I'd protect that time for yourself and your deep, intense work or the stuff that's the most important or is going to get you the best return on that time. And so for, for a normal, um, I'm using um, air quotes, <laughs> normal, for the early birds and the moderates, um, I say, you know, you don't want to book meetings before 10. You want to have that time to get get your head on straight. You want to choose what you're doing in that time. And then you can give your smarts and have your meetings later in the day. Well, that's what I'd say to you. So if, let's say you come good around between two and four. I'd say, well, for goodness sake, don't book any meetings at that time. That's your time. Um, and then you can release the time to other people's needs as required. And that's literally what I like. The, the time for me for writing is between 2 and 5 p.m. And then again from 10 till midnight. Like those are my times. And that's so it's in, it's it, and what I find also and we were talking about AI and, and different tools that we can leverage. This is where, you know, and, and I know you touch on this a little bit in, in the book, but it, you obviously don't want to go specific with certain tools because tools come and go. They've changed. We've, but the idea of being able to say, hey, you know what? I want to protect this time. I'm going to use a tool like Savvy Cal or something like that to block it off so no one can book time. Be, and then what I do, what I love about that is, and you even alluded to this, this idea of you, someone canceling a meeting on you and you feeling delight because you gave them agency and then they like, you have agency. So if you put on there, like, these are my available times and you send someone a booking link, they're not thinking, oh my gosh, look how little, like, look what they've blocked off unless you've like blocked off everything. But they'll mostly think, wow, I can't believe that Donna or Mike is giving me so much of their schedule to book. That's what they're thinking. They're not thinking uh, the negative. Um, so it's interesting that the way that you can protect this, especially I believe, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You need those safeguards if you suck at like, creating those boundaries yourself because you like to please people. If you have technology that can kind of create safeguards for you, I think that's that's brilliant to do. Completely agree because sometimes we're just not clever enough about that. And the other thing I happen, I think happens is that we, particularly those who work in kind of corporate settings, we go into those with assumptions of unreasonableness. Mm. It is unreasonable for me to protect all this time and it is and other people are unreasonable. They just book things on top of things and and it would be unreasonable for me to cancel or to reject those. So I think if we also adopt attitudes of reasonableness, it is perfectly reasonable for you to protect your time and have boundaries around that to get your good work done. It's perfectly reasonable if someone, no matter how senior they are, someone asks you for a meeting and if it's over top of time you've protected, it is perfectly reasonable to say, actually, can we do it later or tomorrow or earlier or whatever? Because I'm just not free at that time. And you kind of don't have to explain that. And yet, gee, we feel compelled to because of this assumption of unreasonableness, right? And if you have to explain it repeatedly, then you need to look at the subtext of everything that's going on in your work relationship if that's the case, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, great. Last question before we wrap up. And this has to do with some of the buying back the time, like getting this idea of refunding your time. So you talked about the commute earlier on during the pandemic, and we were seeing some of that open back up. We're seeing return to work, seeing hybrids. But I have one of the emerging topics that came up well before the, the pandemic was this idea of a no meeting day. So I would love to hear because I have I have opinions on that. What are your thoughts on no meeting days? Like an organization or a person saying, I don't do meetings on this day. I'm a bit nervous given that you've got opinions on it. That feels like a loaded (laughs) question, but you know, I'll give it a go. And this is really because I just read an article about this today, about some research that's um, coming out of, uh, look, I don't remember specifically. Mm. I'll I'll go and have a look and we can put a link in um, for it. And it talked about the benefits of, They basically said people who are testing one to five no meeting days, go figure. So Shopify just said they'll just cancel all meetings. So this is um, now the the, what's coming back is that people feel more in control. 
they're getting stuff done, they feel very productive, it's improving well-being. So all the tick, 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 tick of all the good measures. Where I think it's tricky is where an individual says, I don't do meetings on a Wednesday. You're going to get always more success if, you know, let's say I work in a functional team, my whole team says we all agree no meeting Wednesdays or something like that. You get much better results if you do something like that. For you or I as individuals out in the world, anyone that's listening that maybe runs their own business or practice and has a lot more, to use your word, agency over their time, mm-hmm. uh, I, I fully support trying to have one day, not necessarily where it's not meetings. What I try to do is protect at least one day a week from <laughs> BAU, And the reason I do that is that's my adaptive capacity. It means that, you know, I get an email from Mike Barty that says, hey, I'd love to have you on my podcast. Um, And I say something like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so busy and popular. Couldn't possibly find time for at least six months, right? I never want to be that person that hasn't got time to take up an opportunity or talk to a prospective client or whatever. So I protect a whole day. Uh, from what I refer to as BAU stuff, so that then someone does call and say, hey, I have got availability if I need to. So I know that may not quite be, I might be hedging my bets here a little bit. I might not quite be answering your question. Um, But yeah, so what do you think? (laughs) So I typically, Fridays are my days where I don't book anything. So I keep Fridays open mainly for two reasons. Number one, I like because I theme my days. So Friday is kind of like my cheat day, which means I'll work through using different ways of, of, you know, facilitating my attention, but also for the very reason you're mentioning, like, Hey, I want to catch up on. So I have some room there, but I'm not a big fan of no meeting days because I think you earn more time back. If you have no meetings after a certain time or before a certain time, five days a week. So, and what I, what I've seen happen is if you say, I don't have meetings on Wednesdays is if depending on the organization, the other days just fill up more. And then Mm. Wednesday or whatever that day is, becomes a day where there's still anxiety surrounding it because you've got this day and it's, I mean, you know, there's no meetings that day, but our energy ebbs and flows. You talk about space and, and capacity. Like if you're trying to put all that deep work in one day, it's not going to work, right? No, I completely agree. And so thank you for influ- influencing my thinking in this way. Cause as you were talking, I'm like, gee, I'd much rather you say no meetings before 10 every day. Or after so three. Like, well, exactly. Depending. I was going to say yeah. after four, but yeah, so I book in and there's two aspects to that. One, it means I can, according to a, um, uh, early bird or, um, moderate chronotype, yep. it means that I'm protecting the time where I'm at most mentally alert and can do some great work and can get ahead of the curve. But for me, it energetically bookends my day. I control how my day starts and I control how it ends. Yep. Because too often you can walk into the office or walk into your working context and you're suddenly at the mercy of meetings and emails and all sorts of craziness. And so the fact that you can say I'm in control of that, those two aspects, I think is is great. So I'm kind of with you uh, on this. I certainly don't dis- – don't, certainly – I don't disagree around right, that right. idea of spreading it out. Well, and the other thing is, again, the math. Like if you have two hours dedicated five days a week, that's 10 hours you're earning back as opposed to like a full day. Now, what's the other problem is, is I think the human ego plays a role. Like if somebody says, I don't do meetings on Wednesdays, there's a, I think there's more of an emotional response to like that than we don't do meetings before 11 or we don't do meetings after three. I think that, I think that, 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 can, that can be a problem, not necessarily for the sender, they have to work past that. But for the person on the other side going, hey, oh, really? You don't do – like there's a lot – I get that and I've – it's it's becoming more accepted to send a booking link than to do the email dance back and forth. It's becoming more I accepted. I completely agree. Do you know, I'm thinking I, – I think if you just said I don't do meetings before 10 or 11 or whatever time you choose, I don't reckon you even need to announce it. No. Someone tries, so whereas if someone tries to book, even if you did protect a whole day, you just, this send, idea them a, of, just send them a booking link. <laughs> I'm doing Wednesdays. Yeah. Um, it, it could be just simply, they say, can I book a meeting on a Wednesday? You don't say, I don't do meetings on a Wednesday. You just say, look, I'm not available that day, yep. but I am good Thursday. Or yep. no, I'm not available before 10 yep. um, anytime this week, but I could do 11. Yep. You know, I just think this, it's, it's this idea, there's ego attached to it. Yep. There's also... There's also entitlement there a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I just say, you know what? I love this idea of here's the booking link, which says, look how much availability I have, which is more of an abundance mindset versus a 
I don't do meetings on a Wednesday, yeah. which feels like a scarcity mindset, right? Exactly, exactly. So there's lots, I mean, there's lots more that we didn't get to uh, that you can find in the book, The One Day Refund, Take Back Time, Spend It Wisely. Donna, thank you so much for being here today. Where can people pick up the book and keep up with the work that you're doing? Okay, so DonnaMcGeorge.com is probably the easiest uh, way. I mean, I'm on all the online bookstores, whichever um, uh, Amazon dot whatever you go to, you'll find me there. Um, and so, yeah, and I'm also across all social medias. Um, I get ChatGPT to help me with my shameless self promotion because it's much better at it than I am. Which kind of alluding to our conversation earlier. So you'll get me on all the socials as well, and and I do bleat about my stuff. So. You'll find me there. Donna, thanks so much for joining me for a productive conversation today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks to Donna for joining me on the program. You can find all of the relative links, stuff we discussed at productivityist.com slash podcast 474. And again, if you want to support the show beyond listening like you did just now, subscribe, hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast. That way you can go back to all the 470 plus episodes, find them quickly, easily, and you won't miss a single episode of what's to come. And we got Megan Hyatt Miller on next episode. We're going to talk about mindset and minding your mindset. And again, vault episodes, we're going to bring back some of the greatest hits as we get closer to the summer months. That's what we're doing right now. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to support our sponsors by sharing this link. So that way you can check out our sponsors and say, hey, you know what? I heard about you from Mike Vardy in a productive conversation. Go to productivities.com slash podcast sponsors. Check out the sponsors you've heard on today's episode and also other sponsors as well. All right, that's it. We're done. Uh, time for you to go take some time back and spend it wisely. Uh, until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.